It's 9 o'clock at WWRR Scranton Wilkesbury. This is a Decades Artist Spotlight. Hi, it's Rick Richards from the Georgia Satellites. My honey, my baby, don't put my love upon no ship. She said, don't hand me no lines and keep your hands to yourself. Hey, everybody, this is Jerry Grant from Honeymoon Week. Hi, this is Neil Dowdy of REO Speedwagon. This is Decades, Joey Kramer. And you're listening to Decades with Joey Kramer. And you're listening to Decades with Joey Kramer. This is the Decades Artist Spotlight. Now, here's Joey Kramer with this week's artist. We are on a Decades Artist Spotlight. I've been talking about it all night. Tonight, Here I Go Again is the name of the movie. Co-writer, co-producer Steve McClure, who starred in a movie with his uh, lifelong friend Kyle Kruger. And we have Steve with us tonight. So we're going to get talking to him in just a few minutes. But there is a band that they created. Even though they set out to reform... The band they had in the 80s, they they formed a whole new project, which was called Bullet in the Chamber. Bullet in the Chamber, remember that. So why not? We're going to play some Bullet in the Chamber here on Decades. Gone again, and then we're going to get to Steve McClure right here on the Decades Artist Spotlight.
This is the Decades Artist Spotlight with Joe E. Kramer, this week's artist. It is another Decades Artist Spotlight. Tonight we are here with, uh, I gotta say, singer, songwriter, film producer, director. Of course, the movie is Here I Go Again. Mr. Steve McClure is with us. How you doing, Steve? Good. How's it going? Here I go again. I mean, that's obviously what I want to talk about. But before we even get to that, uh, let us a little bit about you, because I mean, this was a big journey for you. But before you even did this, you know, tell us what the everyday Steve was like before he decided to do this movie. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a background in, in television and uh, you know production, so um, making a film kind of wasn't like a big stretch for me right. and uh, my, my producing partner, Kyle. Uh, we had previously worked on another documentary before this, um, and it was really completely something completely different. It was about like the Cambodian Holocaust. Right, I saw that one. So, <laughs> yeah, so that we decided, hey, like what can we do next to make something a little more fun, a little more something that kind of, you know, touched our hearts a little bit and, and something, a subject that we really enjoyed. And then we kind of came up with the idea to, to do this film and we just took it from there. And, you know, how did the how did the idea come about? You just touched on it a little bit, but, you know, how was it born? Like all of a sudden, was it just as you said, all of a sudden you decided, hey, let's let's try to do this? Yeah, well, as Kyle always likes to say, it, it started on a bar stool uh, after a couple beers. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean... I've known Kyle, who's also my partner in the film, and he's the on-screen partner in the film as right. well, um, since seventh grade. So, uh, you know, we we were in a band in the 80s, and, um, you know, we had a good time doing it. We were just kind of nobodies, really. I mean, it, it didn't go anywhere. And then everybody kind of went their own separate ways. And so, you know, we're back, you know, in our kind of midlife time i guess and we're like hey you know kind of what can we do and what can we do that that we'd have fun doing and we're like hey why don't we just try to reform the band we had from the 80s and we started talking about it and we said hey that'd be a pretty cool idea but you know a movie just about two nobodies probably wouldn't be that interesting to an audience so we said well why don't we see if we can like talk to all these guys that we grew up watching on MTV and had all their albums on the walls and everything else and we sit in and kind of get their advice on how they would approach our journey you know and and how could they help us along the way so we set out to kind of go after all these kind of musical heroes of ours and include them in the film and one just kind of led to another and it, and we ended up getting a bunch of them for the film and it just kind of took on a life of its own yeah, I found it funny because you and Kyle seem to be, you said you've been best friends in seventh grade, but you seem to be so much different throughout the film. And, you know, I, I was it was funny because it always looked like he was giving you, like, the crazy eye every once in a while. Like, are we really doing this? Are you completely nuts? Like, he looked like he wanted to abandon ship more than once. Well, that's the thing about it. I think, like, the dynamic between us, I mean, we, we've been told that we're like an old married couple more than <laughs> That's one, exactly than what day. it seemed like. You're and, right. Yeah. I mean, we just have different philosophies, different um, different personalities. I mean, and that's cool. I mean, and that's probably why we stayed friends for so long. It's just because, you know, he's I'm more of like on the practical side, and he's more of like, hey, we can make anything happen, and it's just you know, it just kind of balances each other out. I mean, it doesn't mean I want to kill him half the time, and I'm sure vice versa. But uh, you know, that's just kind of the way it worked out. So, tell us a little bit about the band Tricks, because um, Tricks, yeah. I mean, there obviously was a trickster. Everybody knows about that, but you were not trickster. You were tricks. And you said yep, it was a tricks. bunch of... You never actually, obviously, recorded anything. And the movie touches a little bit on it, but everybody thought they were in a band back in the, back in the late 70s and 80s. I mean, I wanted to be Kiss. I mean, me and my friends used to get the tennis rackets out. I got an, even I bought an acoustic guitar, and we called ourselves Dynasty. We never right. actually could play an instrument, but we were cool walking around saying we were in a band, and you kind of did the same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's how it started. We we were we were saying we were in a band before we were, we were really in a band because that was kind of the cool thing right. to do. So in high school, you know, we said, "Hey, let's form a band." And again, none of us knew how to play, and we kind of learned along the way. I mean, um, we actually did get to a place where we were okay. I mean, we weren't great, we weren't terrible either. But I mean, we you know we held our own, and it was like right around like right after high school, like eighty five, eighty six. And no, we never went in the studio, recorded anything. We wrote some original songs, 
um, actually, which was kind of rare for like a young band back then. But we played a lot of covers too. You know, playing all of our idols like Cinderella and Dokken and Rat and Poison. I mean, we played all that, and we dressed like French prostitutes. You know, with uh, which was, <laughs> that was which the was look, <laughs> like the look back then <laughs> with heavy makeup and spandex, right? And, um, and you know, I mean, we 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 were more of a show than really like. Uh, talented musicians. I mean, uh, our guitarist Gordon, who was in that band, was probably not probably he was the best musician in the band, and he's like one of the ones that's still like playing to get today, and he was great. So, I mean, we, you know, we had potential, as Kyle likes to say. I kind of knew it was just for what it was, and um, you know, like I ended up going to college and kind of disbanding the whole idea of, of of music, and you know, people got married and people moved away, and. You know, everyone just kind of went their separate ways um, after a not very long uh, career. But, I mean, we, we were all friends, and, you know, there was no, like, fighting with the band, within the band, and everyone liked each other genuinely, and so it was a good group of guys. So that's kind of why when we said, hey, why don't we try to reform it, there was no bad blood between anyone. We're like, hey, these these guys were our friends. They're cool. Let's try to find them now after 25 years. Well, we haven't we haven't talked to any of them in that long. And that was kind of part of the story that, that we told in the film. And you know it's funny because the uh, the film itself went in such a different direction than when you yeah. first start watching. You know, in the beginning, it's all about you're going to reform this band, you're going to find these guys, and you're going to ultimately, you know, maybe record or play, you know, play a gig. And if things didn't work out, and you took it in a different direction, but it worked. Yeah, well, the film we set out to make was definitely not the film that we finished. I mean, um, it, you know, we weren't prepared for that as well. Um, you know, we had an idea that it was going to be going this direction. And then when it didn't, you know, that's kind of like a real life scenario right there. And we had a bunch of those kind of left turns that, that happened to us along the way. And, and like I said, that's why kind of why it took the film took five years to make. And it was really kind of because it was documenting real time and real life scenarios and real situations that we were facing, you know, on this journey that we were trying to take. And, um, yeah, some, some stuff there was a lot of stuff that we were we weren't prepared for and I, but i think that kind of made it more realistic and and more um just just showing a slice of our lives and kind of what we were really going through and that was cool because the 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 movie wasn't planned i mean as you went along it was real as it was going along it wasn't a scripted you know even if they think people are doing you know these documentary type movies a lot of it's scripted and you could yep. tell you guys didn't know what was going to happen next yep yep so and and me and Kyle made like a conscious decision. It's like, hey, nothing's really off limits. You know, we're going to turn the cameras on, and if if it makes either one of us look not in its greatest, you know, uh, situ- situation, I mean, we we agreed that we'd show that because we wanted it to be real. You know, so there were some vulnerable parts of of our personalities and of our life that we showed, and uh, you know, I mean, we we. We agreed on that, and that's kind of what what ended up on film. And it, it, it obviously, you found out that it takes a lot of money to put together a film because you you guys basically it seemed like you you cashed in and sold everything you had to make this film keep going. Yeah, I mean, the film and the band, you know, were kind of like two separate timelines you know i wanted to really you know make this film and then kyle was really kind of more on the side of yeah let's make a film but like the band is, is important we got to put something together and between the two of those uh, yeah i mean it, it did cost money to keep it going um we both weren't working at you know at the time and it's like you know going on trips to interview someone and and kind of buying and you know gear and things like that i mean all that costs money and uh yeah we just kind of had to find a way to make it work so what was the hardest thing for you uh when you did this film? i mean what was your hardest part in the film was it you know was it learning this stuff and what do you consider to be the hardest part in this in this whole journey um that's a good question that's one no one's really asked before um to be honest, it was probably relearning the guitar after not playing it for 25 years. Um, and, and as I was kind of saying throughout the film, it's going to be like riding a bike. Um, and, you know, I had I literally had not picked up a guitar in 25 years, so I didn't keep it going. And I was never really, like, great to begin with. I mean, I was serviceable back then. But, right. uh, but I mean, you know, and so I'm learning, and then I had to kind of, and then Kyle was writing all the material, so I had to learn it the way he 
wanted it played and you know he had a very distinct kind of style he wanted it to be played like and so i mean yeah that was hard and and just taking that much time out of your life really and devoting that much time to something was was difficult not not guitar playing but the movie itself i mean just hey here's five years of my life that i'm gonna put towards you know basically a dream you know a long shot and uh and kind of give everything up and put everything else on hold while we made that happen. That was pretty tough, too. And you looked at that first guitar lesson, you looked intimidated. You looked like, you know, obviously you said you couldn't, you know, you never really read music. You just played by ear. Yeah. And, you know, not only is it a, a first guitar lesson, but, you know, there's cameras there on you. And right. It, you know, it puts a, it's a whole ne- new level of added pressure on you. you right. Know? So that didn't, that didn't make it easy either. But, I mean... Again, what you see on screen was was really what happened. I mean, I couldn't play hardly a note, you know, and and uh, so I had to really work at it. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of you know musicians, it just comes easy and naturally to them. I'm not one of those people. I mean, if uh, I have to really work to actually be just okay. <laughs> and how true? I mean, I I, I kind of sort of asked this question before, but I'm going to reiterate it again because I. I yeah, I think of it it's watching the movie that it seemed like it really seemed for real that a few times that you looked like you were done and it, Kyle had to say to you, "No, we, we're going to keep doing this." You looked like a few times that you were just you were just done with this whole situation. You didn't want to do it anymore. Was that real or was that you know something for the movie? No, that's totally real, and we both kind of hit that wall a couple times. You know, it's like, is it is it, is it, this really worth it? You know, I mean, we had to ask ourselves that all the time. You know, um, so yeah, there was times where just frustration took over, and you know, lack of an income took over, and and you know, we we hit hurdle after hurdle. People just not getting back to us. Just trying to make things happen for the film was a chore in itself. I mean, we were, we're independent filmmakers. We didn't have any funding for this. We didn't have anyone helping us. We never had, you know, a studio behind us or anything. We we had to make it all happen ourselves. So that was kind of an added stress too as well as not only being the filmmakers, but being on camera as well. So we were on both sides of the camera, which, again, made it twice as hard as just making a film because you're, you know, you, you're taking on two roles. So, yeah, I mean, certainly there were times during this process that we, we were both just like, you know, it's not worth it. And, you know, we, we, we had discussions and, I guess, even arguments over like how we were going to finish this and what we wanted the ultimate um, kind of <clears throat> climax of the film to be and who's going to be happy with what. And I mean, you know, this it's, it's just, there was a lot of pressure on us to, to, to finish it and, and even go as far as we did with it. So yeah, all that was definitely real. <laughs> and you know, something I can relate to um, that obviously I know the two of you went through, I've done a lot of interviews. I've been doing this show for 12 years. I've done probably 200 interviews. But there are certain guys I talk to, certain bands I've talked to that were such an important part of my, you know, of growing up in high school that I, I get nervous even talking to them because you're like looking up to your rock idols. And you were kind of the same way. These are guys that, you know, you didn't know these guys beforehand. And, you know, here you are in the same room with all these, you know, these, I hate to say gods, but these rock gods from when you were a teenager that you had on your wall and you wore their T-shirts and you went to their concerts. And Absolutely. you had that yeah. kind of feeling, I guess? Yeah, and, and that's what made it great. I mean, it, you know, I mean, it was a little intimate, you know, maybe the first couple we, we felt like that. But after after we kind of got rolling and we, and we kind of hit our stride with, we, all right, we know what we want to get out right. of this. We know what we want to ask them. And then it was just like, wait a minute. Now these guys are playing on our record, you know, we're in the studio and, and, you know, they're producing our album and like, you know, like <laughs> I would have never, I would have never dreamed that in my life, like, you know, 25, 30 years ago when I'm watching them on MTV, you know, to, but to have like Steve Blaze of Lillian X playing on our record. Hey Steve, can you do a solo for us for this uh, song that we're working on? Oh, you never, sure, you never thought those words you. would come out of your mouth. <laughs> Yeah, and it was amazing. So, like, just just getting that experience uh, was was totally worth all of the heartache and all of the struggles and everything we went through. It was it was very cool because not a lot of people get to to say they they experienced. That was the best part.
Decades Artist Spotlight continues. Now, here's Joe E. Kramer with this week's artist. We're on a Decades Artist Spotlight. Steve McClure, co-director, actor, and of course, uh, co-producer of Here I Go Again. You call it acting, but it's so much like a true story, as Steve has said, you know, and so many times they wanted to quit. It was really a great movie. I got the link up on my Facebook page, Decades with Joe E. Kramer. You can check out the link there. And uh, it'll also link you, I believe, to a preview of the movie, which will be up there also on the 105 The River uh, Facebook page. 
Dempsey is a great guy. The movie is really good. I would not lie to you. You want to check this out. Part number two, we're going to talk to Steve working with Ron Keel, who helped produce the album and even had Kyle sing on his album. So it was going pretty good near at the end. And uh, the next song up, we're going to have two more songs up, actually. Your Crime and Head Down, which is actually the song they performed in a movie. So straight ahead, more coming up. Don't go anywhere. Steve McClure from Here I Go Again, right here on the Decades Artist Spotlight. Hang on. This is the Decades Artist Spotlight. Northeast PAs, wanna fight the river. Decades Artist Spotlight continues. Now, here's Joe E. Kramer with this week's artist. We're on a 
Steve's Decades Are to Spotlight. Steve McClure, Here I Go Again is the name of the movie. I can't say enough about this movie. I really liked it. I got my copy down at the M3 Festival, and uh, I've watched it three times. I've watched all the... It's got amazing extras on it, too. So, And all the artists that we love, all those hair metal artists, a lot of them are on the movie. It's very cool. So let's get back to Steve McClure. Here I go again on the Decades Artist Spotlight. Ron Keel, who I know you did a lot of work with, and I want to talk about him next. I mean, I've had him on my show. I just talked to him again last week. He is one of the greatest guys. I mean, I really like Ron. When I talk to him, I feel like, you know, I'm talking to, you know, an older brother. He's just, it's so laid back talking to him. And he really took you guys in and, and worked with you. Yep. Yeah, he's just a genuine good dude, you know? I he mean, is. he really is. And and what you kind of see is what you get with him. He's just super nice. He's he's really, like, close with all his fans and everything. He's just a nice guy, you know? But he's also, you know, again, I mean, I saw, I saw Keel, like, in 85 or something, open for Accept, and uh, they were on a triple B with Keel and Accept and Helix, right? And I just remember, you know, I was... 17 going to like the Lakeland Civic Center to see them and it was like a big deal for us we'd see him on MTV all the time too and and you know we interviewed him a couple times and and it took a you know as we started to talk with him more you know again we started to build a relationship and and he kind of just became our mentor on this and you know took us under his wing and I mean and he was a ball buster too I mean he you know he, he he was friendly with us but I mean he knew he had a job to get done and he you know he cracked the whip on us because, you know, I think the whole time he was trying to get the most out of us, too, which was, you know, in the end was really appreciated. Yeah, he seemed like he was a per- he seems like to be a perfectionist when it comes to the music. Yeah. Yep. Uh huh. And we got to see a little part of that, too, because Kyle went on in, in, uh, in preparation kind of for our project sung on Ron's new record on the metal cowboy in yep. Vegas. Yeah, on Vegas. So we got to see a little bit of what what that was like and how that process worked with him. And then, you know, later on, he went on to produce our record for us, um, which was, you know, more of the same. And, uh, you know, again, just a cool experience because I had never been in the studio before and I didn't know what to expect. And um, But I felt like I was pretty prepared for that. I knew the songs and, and I knew my parts and everything. And it wasn't like as terrifying as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> now, were you blown away by the amount of work it takes to make a record? Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it, I it was just does. watching the DVD, and I, you know, I kind of knew it in the back of my mind how long it, you know, what 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 it takes. I, obviously, it's a lot easier nowadays than it was, you know, forty thirty years ago. But it's a, it's amazing how long it takes to do one track, and you know, the rhythm guitar and everything. It, it's it's incredible. Yeah, it does, and and when we especially it was it, it we we were at a bit of a disadvantage because we weren't really a band at that point when we were recording. So, you know, we were using hired, you know, musicians and we never really rehearsed as a band before we went in the studio, which everyone along the line was telling us you have to do, you know, which would, which would have made sense. Right. But we just didn't have the luxury of that, you know, opportunity. So we kind of went into it cold, not having rehearsed the songs with the other players. So that, you know, kind of basically just doubled our time in there. So it, you know, it just, it, you know, time just flies by too when you're in there. All of a sudden, you look at your watch and it's 12 hours later, and you're still in the studio, like recording the same track. You know, so yeah, it was definitely a learning experience, but it was fun. It was it was really cool. It was and fun to do. You had some pretty good musicians playing with you. I know I saw that you had uh, Les Warner from uh, who was with the Colt, and of course you had uh, Stacy Blades. I mean, so you were in there with, uh, with a couple guys playing on the, on the music, which were you know, again, an aha moment. Like I can't believe these guys are playing with me. Absolutely. We walk in and there, and Ron's like, "Hey, so we got you know Les Warner from the Colt to drum on your album." We're like, <laughs> okay. "Oh my gosh, really? All right, that'll work." You know, I mean, and uh, you know, and that w- that was a little intimidating when you're playing with like a professional drummer, and I'm just you know a guy who's like still learning, taking lessons, you know, three months ago or whatever. But uh, you know, so we didn't really like want to let him down, and we didn't want to go in there and, and look like fools, you know. So. <laughs> Um, that, that's why I said, I mean, we did a lot of preparation before that to, to, to get in there. So, um, so we, so we wouldn't look like idiots. And, and I think it, I think it turned out all right, but yeah, we got to play with some really great musicians on that and it was just a really cool experience. So what was your absolute favorite part of this, of this five-year journey that you took? What, when you look back now, what was your favorite part of the whole experience? When I saw the DVD finally in my hand that it's done. 
<laughs> I'm like, yes, it's over. That is my favorite part now. Um, uh, actually, that was a good moment. Like, when it's like, all right, it's done. But, I mean, as far as, like, you know, the production and the journey and everything, I think just, man, we got to, like, I think just the whole experience of just being able to go backstage and talk to people and, like, actually have, like, some clout around, you know, some of these festivals and uh, musicians kind of knowing who we were by the end of it and stuff, which was cool, and and, and them returning your calls and things. I don't know. It's just kind of a, a good feeling to to really think you've, you've, you're on to something here and, you know, it might amount to just a little bit. And, um, so that was kind of cool too. Just, just to be recognized just a little bit, I think was, was cool. Now you came up with the name, uh, bull in the chamber. Now whose idea was that? That was Kyle. I kind of wanted to stick with tricks, but, right. uh, we were, fight- we were fighting about that too. So, um, you know, we wanted something that's, that didn't really sound dated and, and kind of pigeonhole us into that 80s genre so um you know kyle came up with that name and um you know we went with it and what did you honestly think of the music because i thought it was you know after not playing and it, when i heard the first performance i mean it was as good as anything you hear i mean i was at eyes uh it was eyes and fi- eyes in fire first and then you turned it to eyes eyes of fire was the original one and it turned into eyes on fire is that correct correct yeah, yeah, and Kyle, you know, and that, all that credit goes to Kyle, just kind of uh, reworking kind of the song from back then and, and putting a spin to it that, you know, hopefully people can relate to today, uh, writing all the lyrics, writing all the music for, for the songs. I mean, that was all him, you know, and uh, yeah, I thought it came out great. I thought the production of the of the record was great, you know, and, um, and yeah. You know, we did that in like five days, you know, in, in the studio. So, um, yeah, I thought it turned out great. And give a, a favorite song that you, that you did. I mean, there's about five new songs that we that you did in, you know, as far as the movie and the soundtrack. Was there a favorite? There was you, you uh, trying to think, Your Crime, Gain. Um, what else was there? Eyes on Fire, Gone Again. I know, yep. I'm, I know I'm missing one off the top and, of my head. And here, then there's, but, yeah, there was one that we had to live. Uh, hold, hold, hold my head. Hold down. my head, that's right. Yeah, I mean, those are great. I mean, we ended up, um, like, learning probably, I mean, there was a, there was more songs than, than what was recorded on that CD. Um, and then a couple, a couple of those that we played live were a bit heavier, you know, than what you heard and kind of had just more of a little bit heavier crunch metal sound to them. I think a couple of those were, I, I, I liked a little better than what was recorded. So, I mean, there was a good variety, though, I think, that, uh, across the board. So, yeah. So, what happy did- with all the stuff. So what are you doing right now with the movie? I know, are you both doing this movie tour that I've seen advertised? And actually, I saw it down at M3. I saw there was, uh, I was down at M3, and I, I saw um, the, the movie was being filmed the day, or shown the day before we got there. But what are you doing as far as the movies now? Yeah, I mean, it's, well, obviously, it's for sale on, um, you know, Amazon and uh, digital platforms, and you can stream it online, or you can rent it, or you can buy the DVD, so there's lots of different ways you can uh, get it through our website, hereigoagain.com. Well, how about you personally? But, uh, are you out there doing anything with him, or is it just, I, I didn't know if the two of you are still out there promoting the film. I know I've seen one and two of you, but I have. are you both together out there? Yeah, I mean, Kyle does the majority of it, right. um, and he's he's literally loading up his car with all of the T-shirts and movies, and, you know, <laughs> I mean, like, there, there's no room in his car for, like, to squeeze, like, you know, a napkin or anything. I mean, it's ridiculous. And he's driving kind of all across the country to show the film, and uh, right before M3, we kind of did a northeast leg up there where we were around, um, you know, Virginia and Pennsylvania and uh, North Carolina, and I, I kind of make it when I can. You know, I'm not always able to attend all of them. So, like, M3, I wanted to make sure I was there because, you know, we had the concert to tag on to that, uh, which was cool. And now we're just kind of planning the next leg of it, and that's going to be him and taking it out on the road again and uh, just pimping the movie and trying to get as much people, as many people to see it and hear about it as possible. And that's, a, that's, a, that's our biggest challenge, you know, is just getting people to know about it. You know, I mean, we're on Facebook, and we have, you know, like, 10,000 followers on Facebook, but I'm telling you right now, 10,000 people haven't bought that movie. <laughs> well, I mean, so, it's, a, it's um, you know, you're not backed by this major studio. You're doing this on your own. So, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it takes time. And like I said, I mean, everybody who I know I've seen it has said nothing but good things to say about it. Nobody has said anything bad. 
So, I mean, well, you're getting good word of mouth for it. And like I said, tonight on the show, I'm going to be playing some music, obviously, from Bullet in the Chamber. So they're going to be getting some airplay here. Now, what about that band? What's the status of that band? Um, well, the, after after the film was done and after we kind of played that show, um, I basically went and got a job again. Um, <laughs> you need to pay know. some bills. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, I was about to be in the poorhouse and living under a bridge. So, right. Uh, I, I went and got a job. Kyle definitely, again, because, um, you know, as you, you'll see in the film, I mean, we're just kind of, he has more of a passion for the music than I do. And that's not saying that I don't want to do it. It's just, it's just he's more adamant about it, and he is. It's it's that's where really what's driving him, you know, these days is to kind of create music and to be in a band. So he, I, I kind of left the band. I like to say I retired after that show, after my after my one show, um, and he kind of put together another lineup uh, together and played like another show in Denver. Um, but now I think he's still trying to, you know find that perfect lineup to uh and i know he really wants to record a full album um uh which is in his works but as far as like i mean he's going to keep it going he's going to keep the band going and uh, and record music as long as he can my interest level in it is is probably waned and uh you know i'm kind of back to making a living so you know in 10 years um, you could do 10 years you could do a reunion tour and you could uh, you could tour chamber reunion. you get yeah. bullet chain you could do you could tour stadiums and you you know you know once even though you say a reunion you know this is our final you could do the tour five or six times i mean it yep. does you don't have to say goodbye in the first time just like all the other bands it's their final tour then five years later a final tour kiss has said goodbye at least 10 times yeah i remember i saw the who's farewell tour in, a- in 1982 <laughs> <I know>. um, <laughs> and that's no joke yeah i know yeah so We'll, uh, yeah, we'll reunite Bull in the Chamber, and maybe we'll make a film about it, you know? So gonna, the other question I asked, I guess one of the final questions here is, what, are you guys ever going to get, are you gonna thinking of getting back together to do another movie, perhaps? Is something, you know, is that something on the horizon? Yeah, I mean, we've we've thrown a lot of stuff around, uh, ideas around, we talked about it. I mean, this this took a lot out of us, and it's still, and, you know, the work is still needed on this right you know? so it's not like you know we made this and it's in all right next project up um it's now it's just going to sit on the, su- the shelf and sell itself um so that's not really happening so like i said kyle's still out marketing and marketing is like a full-time job so i mean we've talked about other ideas um there's nothing really 100 percent um on the table right now so we'll just, we'll just kind of see what happens but i'm you know i'm open to it well, I know it's great now that it's available everywhere. Like you said, it's available on Amazon. Um, I know I saw the music. Some of the music's on iTunes, too, as well. Is that correct? Yep. I know I saw the music correct. on iTunes, um, and it's available for sale. Because a lot for a while, I couldn't find it to buy it. And I finally got my copy down at M3, but now it's pretty much, you know, you could go in and get it just about anywhere. Yeah, and, and there's links, too, like if, if you don't want the physical DVD. I mean, there's it, it, we're, we're on several different platforms that you might not have heard of. So it's, yeah, I mean, all of the main information is on our site. So that'll that'll take you to, like, streaming options and things like that from uh, from our site. Which is here I yeah, go, I mean, hereigoagain.com. Yep, that's correct. So this uh, hopefully we can find something new for you. And if, I, mean, I would love to see a Bullet in the Chamber reunion. So we've got to keep that in your mind. Ten okay. years, ten years down the line, <laughs> you could go reunite all the members again, and you could do a part two. That means I'm going to have to re relearn the guitar again <laughs> uh, because because it's kind of been collecting dust again since. Uh, so you that haven't, last, you that haven't last played in five years I'm, now. I'm not going to lie. All right, it's it's still kind of I still have it, but it's just it's not getting much use. We're here with Steve McClure tonight for the Decades Artist Spotlight. Of course, Here I Go Again is the movie. Bullet in the Chamber is the band. Steve, it's been fantastic having you on the show tonight. Yeah, I appreciate you talking to me about it. It was a great time. Hey, this is Steve McClure from Here I Go Again, and you're listening to Decades with Joey Kramer. Some things only happen once in life. First things, last things, and these things. So please, give me a warm Denver welcome.
week's Decades Artist Spotlight continues. Now, here's Joe E. Kramer with this week's artist. We are on a Decades Artist Spotlight, and, of course, Steve McClure. He is from he is from the uh, the movie Here I Go Again. You heard his story. Now all you got to do is get out and buy the DVD. I, I promise you, it is a great watch. It's under two hours. It's a documentary style, kind of like found footage. I love found footage. So if you're into that, you'll love it even more. And that song right there was the finale, Held Down, Head Down, which was played in Denver at the end of the movie to culminate their journey that took years in the making. And uh, they got to play in front of a crowd again. Not quite as trick, but as bullet in the chamber. So cool stuff. Got to thank Steve McClure for joining us. Now, next Saturday night, we will do another Decades Artist Spotlight back-to-back. We will have Kelly Kagi here, the drummer and uh, co-lead vocalist of Night Ranger. Yes, I've been waiting for this one for a long time. Kelly Kagi, next Saturday night on the Decades Artist Spotlight. You do not want to miss it. If you missed it tonight, it'll be available on our podcast on Spreaker.com, links from Facebook and our website and all that good stuff. So back to the music, right? We got more coming up. This is Decades on Total Reach Radio, 105 The River, around the world. 105theriver.net, Decades with Joe E. Kramer.com, RadioBowl.com, TuneIn Radio, and uh, that Radio Bowl app, which is free for your iPhone or Android device. More Decades coming up next. Hang on.